Welcome back to FYI for the For Your Institution podcast presented by Mongoose. I'm your host, Gil Rogers, and today I'm excited to be joined by Andrew Veach and Dave Marshall. Andrew serves as VP of Technology and Dave as founder and CEO of Mongoose. Uh, today, we plan to discuss the marketing buzzword du jour, chat GPT, and what the team at Mongoose, who have been leading the way with communicating with students via text messaging and chat solutions for, seems like forever now, uh, and what they believe the technology has in store for us in the short and the long term. Before we get started, I would love to lay the foundation a bit and let you do, you both take it from here and go kind of, we'll just unscripted, we clicked record and just started having this conversation. So Andrew, I'll start with you um, and we'll, we'll then go from there. There are, are so many articles, videos, posts, uh, you name it, probably produced by ChatGPT. We'll get there in a second. Uh, for, the, for, for those who have been maybe busy reading applications or traveling, recruiting on behalf of their schools, it might have been a little hard for them to keep up with, with all of the context and all the buzz. So I felt it might take, make sense to have someone with your background in your mind kind of take a, take a shot at defining for us and defining for, for our audience, what is chat GT, GPT and why the heck is everyone talking about it? Thanks, Gil. Yeah, that's a great. It's a great place to start. I think for for any kind of new technology, but it's specifically one that kind of appears to be as significant and and as as world changing potentially as this is. It's it's great to have that background and context for everything else because it's really hard to, to to pick apart the the hype and the possibilities and the um, the the potential and the risks without kind of understanding how it works in the first place. And I I uh, you know believe it or not, I've been having to explain a lot of it family members and and friends and especially my mm -hmm. my children over the past few months as they've become enamored with it and that's um you know it's made me need to do a bit of a deep dive also to understand it better myself because because on the surface it it does appear to be nothing short of magic and you know while I I'm an experienced software developer the, the folks that work on this kind of technology are, are highly specialized and it's very it's um it, there's a lot going on there to say the least and I think the best place to start is to pick apart the GPT piece of it from from the chat piece and talk about GPT specifically. So the there's a company um, named Open API or Open AI who's been working on in this in this field for a number of years now. And the the GPT piece it's a it's a uh, artificial intelligence model. It stands for generative pre trained transformer. And they they've had this technology out in in the wild since 2020. And um, there have been a number of AI writing assistants assistants using it since then. Um, there's a tool that that Microsoft, Microsoft was a huge supporter of OpenAI, um, built a coding assist, assistant called GitHub Copilot using it. That's a, that's been out for several years, and it's it's made a huge difference in the world of software development. Um, but that model itself um, didn't really get attention until it, a chatbot was put in front of it, um, and that's really what brought it to the public public's attention when Chat GPT was released because. We're all very comfortable with chatbots. We love interacting with them. It's very natural. It's it's being being able to have a human conversation with this incredibly powerful model behind it. So what what is GPT itself? It it's what's called a large language model, um, and that's it, it's just what it sounds like. It's it's a um, it's a model that comprises in a massive amount of text that it's been trained on. It's a um, a neural network, which is something in AI that is it basically is is a model that's meant to mimic. The human brain. So it it, mm -hmm. it um, functions on a number of connections between different pieces of information the same way the neurons in our brain do. And this model, um, GPT, has been trained using essentially everything on the internet. Um, it, it's been trained on 500 or so on billion, um, they, they say tokens when you read about it, you can think about a token roughly being a word. Um, everything on the internet, um, books, Wikipedia, software code um and in total there's about 175 billion they call them parameters but those are connections the same way as we have connections in our brain they have that many connections between the data um data points in that model and what it uses that for is basically doing a very very good job of predicting the next word that comes after a set of other words so when uh, you've interacted with the chat gpt as i imagine a, a number of people listening to this have and you, you prompt it with a question, you ask it to write a poem or explain something to you, it, based on this sort of sum of human knowledge that has been fed to it, 
is able to do an amazing job predicting the next word or words that come after it. And that's really all it is. It boils down to statistics. It knows the statistical probability of what it should follow with after you've given it a prompt. Um, and because of that, it, 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 you can have a very natural conversation with it. It's been trained on human writing. It, it can converse um, like a human. It can, it can understand what you're asking for. It can write poems. It can write songs. Um, and it, it appears to have an amazing grasp of knowledge, um, but I think it's important to realize at the root of it, it's been trained by everything we've given it, essentially the, the internet, um, and it is able to have this statistical model that understands, okay, based on what you've asked me to do, these are the words that should follow. Yeah, and I, I, it's funny that you mentioned you, you can write songs for you. It can do all those sorts of things. I, I asked ChatGPT to write a summary of a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie for me, and it was rather predictable. It was, you know, you meet the hero, they go through some troubles, CGI fight at the end, and that's it. And that was the formula for years. And so it's, it's followed that, which is kind of fun. Um, one of the things, Dave, I wanted to ask you, you know, you and I have had many conversations over the years about you know new technology and how it fits into student engagement plans and communication plans. Uh, we all know that sometimes things take a very long time to infiltrate higher ed, specifically as an industry. Um, you know, there's always kind of that angst around. You know, we're always you know taught doing the old thing over and over again. Can't don't no time to try anything new. Then an inflection point happens, right? An example of this, of course, uh, mo most recently was the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And this drove institutions to adapt remote learning. It drove them to use digital tools and outreach, whether it be video, text messaging, as ways of keeping in touch. From, from your perspective, is this another one of those inflection points? And if you're talking with a, this, a, a enrollment leader, let's say at a college or university, how does this new thing interact with the current things that they that they're doing and how does it help to support them better? So um, what I'm what I'm hearing the the crux of the question is, is this another inflection point that that um, rather rapidly is going to change the way that higher education needs to react or perform um, yeah. off, off the top of my head? COVID, I think, will, will prove to be a more significant short term. Um, like the kids aren't coming to the, the school now. <laughs> you have to change the way you physically do something. Um, when we're talking about a technology um, like chat GPT, I don't think it's going to change the way admissions officers or student success coaches or advisors or fundraisers do their job tomorrow or next month or next quarter. Um, it's certainly going to be a lovely topic of conversation to think about um, around um, what if students use this tool to write content and to write their essay or when they're in um when they're at the school to help write their homework or write, you know so um from that perspective I, I think on the academic side there's more considerations i i don't think any are um world changing um i think that this technology is going to be world changing. <laughs> so I'm gonna say this in two ways. It's not gonna have near term effects on the day-to-day -day lives of people that work in higher ed. Um, it will definitely be a, um, a wonderful supplemental teaching tool that students can choose to use on their own or faculty can choose to incorporate into their courses. Um, I have a son, he, he's 12. Um, so he's not going to college anytime really soon, but if he were going to college, I would hope that they, he would be going to a school that would, first of all, not ignore the technology mm -hmm. <laughs> because chat GPT is going to have an effect on the way a lot of people do their jobs in the future. And I definitely would, would want the colleges to embrace it as just another tool in the toolbox to help students learn things and create things. Yeah, I think that's a great point around 
adapting to the tool in a way, right? You've, you've got to, it goes back to goals before tools, right? Like they're at the end of the day, we're still going to have to focus on effectively communicating with prospective students, effectively serving current students and effectively reaching and engaging alumni. And much like, and I would love Andrew, your thoughts on, on this a little bit, coming from the technology side, the way as, as me, me as a higher ed marketer guy, right? The way I, the way I kind of oversimplify this a little bit is chat GPT in many ways is going to be another skill to put on your resume as a bullet. I have skills in chat use of chat GPT, just like I know how to use word, PowerPoint, Excel, HTML, Java, whatever. Right. And, and so it, at the, so when, you know, from a, from a technology head perspective, is that a fair assessment? Is that something that we should be thinking about from a, how we incorporate chat GPT in our, it, it's not going to replace a lot of things that's going to complement and amplify. Is that a fair assessment from a, from a tools and a skills perspective? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, I mean, there's already a term for it. So the idea of prompt engineering um, is, is a not, maybe we're, we're jumping ahead a little bit, calling it a job title, but a skill set for sure. So the, the prompt is essentially what you're feeding um, chat GPT or, or another one of these sort of text um, AI models. And the prompt is you know, you get in what you get out of it, what you put into it, um, which is, is obvious if you play for it a little bit. If you give it a very generic prompt, write me a song, you're going to get a very, very generic response back out. If you are good at prompting the tool, um, so giving it context, giving it information to go with, um, it, you will get a much more well shaped response that's more helpful to you. So I think uh, absolutely, have, there's a skill set to. Um, to using it. And as even as you've seen the last couple iterations of this model come out, so they, they released um, GPT-4, so the fourth version of this model last week, it, it is extremely more capable than the previous one. And with it comes more tools and more capabilities and things that it, it can do. And you need to learn how to interact with it, um, especially as you're looking at that tool as a way of gaining um, gaining efficiency, help helping with um, uh, tasks that maybe don't need as much um, human focus and attention versus something that can can use that. So you think of the example: um, Microsoft is starting to bundle this tool with all of their Office 365 applications, right? So you will be able to use it. You know, think of it as like you know, if you remember Clippy from way back when. This is Clippy on steroids. Like you can feed it. Um, a, a short outline or document and ask it to start your presentation for you. And it will turn that into a set of PowerPoint slides. So you're not sitting there fussing necessarily with the visual design and the layout. You more can be more focused on the content, the thing that actually matters. But to be able to do that effectively, you need to know how to use the tools. Coming back to your original question, it will be a um, a significant boost for folks that know know how to do that effectively. So the, so the people are going to be really good at using chat GPT are going to be like really good parents and really good marketing people who can articulate their message most effectively because the clearer you are with your instructions, the better it behaves, right? So chat exactly. GPT is basically my kids, right? So we'll, we'll summarize it in that way. <laughs> um, well, hey, well, well oh, let's ahead. just, let's just end the show. It's guilt right, kids. Right there. <laughs> chat GPT. Kills kids. That's it. <laughs> Grow your student community, give them a reason to stay, and encourage giving with Cadence, Higher Ed's premier engagement platform for Mongoose. Talk to students, parents, and alumni on their time and how they want. Empower your staff with integrated text and chat inboxes that gather all conversations in one place. Learn more at mongooseresearch.com to see how our best-in-class service and support has helped colleges and universities like yours have smarter conversations. <laughs> uh, Dave, I would love your thoughts again, you know, if we think about higher ed institutions specifically and where, you know, obviously, you know, Mongoose has texting software, has a chat tool. Um, and, you know, I, I'm sure you've thought about, had conversations about where you see this impacting your approach and the, the way that institutions work and leverage your resources. Have the, what what are the highlights that you can share on on what people can expect coming out of uh, coming out of your head and coming out of mongoose over the next six months, twelve months, two years uh, when it comes to this type of technology? So yeah, when when you ask me how profound of a change is is this going to be for higher ed? I think it's I want to clarify it's an extremely profound change with 
how humans can learn and how how they learn and how quickly that they can learn. Um, but back to your question about the tools that people in, in higher ed use, whether it's an engagement platform, it's an ERP system, it's a fundraising platform, it's a CRM, um, all, all of these tools that at the administrators have at the institution, um, this won't happen in the next quarter. But these software providers like Mongoose can start to incorporate tools like chat G GPT into their software. So what do I mean by that? Um, we have a texting and chat platform and that platform has, um, it necessitates staff members at the school needing to proactively send out a message and being able to respond to a message and perhaps um, chat GPT technology could could be used to suggest a response to a student. You know, it, it looks like this student's asking about um, campus safety and a parking plan or something like that. And and per, perhaps uh, the technology can then save the staff member time by saying, looks like this, this student's asking this. And we also have some context that one of the the inputs that could be fed to chat gpt would be this is a second year student you know this is his major th these are the other pieces of information that we have about him so a response could be hyper tailored hy hyper suggested um i don't know how soon we're going to want the uh, the auto created response to just be sent without a uh, human looking at it yet um mm -hmm. but so once those types of things happen, and then all of the, the applications that staff members use every day in higher ed starts to take advantage of that technology, their job becomes more efficient. So, and they can spend more time um, doing the things that only humans can. And that's, that's being empathetic and being caring and troubleshooting and things and things like that. Yeah, I think it's in same, you know, same situation with quite literally every new technology that's come out in support of student outreach, right? It's these things aren't replacing admissions counselors. They're not replacing the, the, the campus visit. They're not replacing a good interaction with a human. What they're doing is making this, the interaction, this, the, making the times in between those interactions better, right? Because now you've got a student who might send a message at two o'clock in the morning because they're stressed out because they feel like they they bombed their midterm and how's that going to impact their admissions decision. They might text the bot that question. Now the human admissions counselor has better intelligence when they're when they're reaching out and being empathetic about that student's situation. Right. And so, you know, it, I, I go back to my my days when I worked at a company doing video events and programs. We, we're never going to replace a, a campus visit with a video information session. Those are meant to supplement those interactions to get more students to connect and engage, right? And so how many students do you miss because they don't want to pick up the phone and call, but they will text a bot to, to answer questions uh, and, to, and to get those the, that type of intel? Um, I, I think there's you know a couple other thoughts that I, I had, and I'd love for you both to kind of just share your perspectives. And Andrew will will uh, kick it back to you. Just kind of thinking about again the the like I mentioned not replacing admissions counselors, not replacing people. It, it if we're not replacing people with 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 these types of technologies, which again I don't think anyone expects or desires to do. What are the uh, if the key elements that and benefits that you think that people will get when applying this in their day to day? And then we'll, Dave, I'll ask you to layer on top of that the the higher education component specifically, um, so we can we have, we have some kind of tangible thoughts around in day to day efficiencies that a human might feel, uh, whether it's via a software platform that they're using or just going to ChatGPT and using their own engineering prompts. Yeah, I think day to day, I think Dave touched on the biggest thing, which is kind of what what efficiencies can you gain in handling more mundane aspects of what you're what you're trying to do um, versus something that really requires your focus and attention to to, to do it well. Um, and I, I think there's obvious obvious implications there for higher ed, but also in um, in general. I think it's I think it's an amazing 
teaching aid as, as sort of a um, someone, uh, an assistant that could kind of ride along with you while you're learning something. The first thing my daughter did when I showed it to her was try to get it to do her math homework for her. I'm not, not making this up. <laughs> she's 15. She's in advanced algebra. It's very challenging. I've had to learn, relearn everything along the way that I've forgotten to help her. Um, and it, it trying to get it to answer a specific question, it is not good at that. It's not a calculator. Again, this comes back to knowing how it's built and how it's structured. But what is it good at? It's read, essentially has read the internet and it knows, it knows math. So if you ask it, how do I approach this type of problem? It can give you an advice. It can give you advice. It can walk you through it. So I think in terms of a, a learning interface, um, like I said, somebody that can kind of, and I think Microsoft's word for it, I don't know if, if they, you know, should give them credit for creating, but they're using it as co-pilot. It's a great term for it. Um, so you can envision a, a set of tools that exist as, as your co-pilot for whatever you're trying to do um, that can work alongside you and um, give you guidance as you're doing it. And you can see just this, this suite of software springing up around that now. Um, just, you know, uh, Khan Academy is the, the most recent one I saw. They announced last week that they're developing a whole set of AI tutors to walk along, work alongside you as you're going through your, wow. uh, your coursework there. So I think that... Um, Having someone to fill in the blanks and the again going back to the chat interface, it's it's so natural that you can converse with it versus going to a search engine um, and trying to find results. And you can continue to have a conversation. So if you the response you get back isn't exactly what you need, you can add you can refine it. So it has has memory. And I'm definitely putting that in quotes to distinguish the fact this is not a human brain. It doesn't actually remember things, but it has the context of your conversation. So you can continue to refine the conversation you're having with it to to, to really drill into the um, the help it, that that you need there. So in that in that sense, it's a very powerful medium to work with um, as a human looking for kind of help working through a set of tasks. Got it, got it. And Dave, the higher ed, let's say we had an admissions council that did want to revolutionize their day to day tomorrow. What are what are some yep. of the things that they they made? Because we have those, right? There's always the early adopters and the nerds yep. that jump into things. And I'm one of them that loves to kind of figure out how do we connect the dots and make it work today. Um, you mentioned some things that might come down the line from Mongoose, but like, what are the what are the things that if a admissions dean or a, a admissions counselor wanted to leverage this tool, what are some things they could do to boost their efficiency now? So I've definitely thought of this. Um, so <laughs> um, our our platform, but but you could you could do the same type of thing with any like web inquiry form or anywhere where a student gets to ask a question or submit a question or have a conversation via email or whatever. Um, is is that if if your super proactive admissions counselor that that really wanted to revolutionize the game. If they were able to spend the time to go back and mine all of those conversations, whether it's by email or by chat or by text or by web form submission or or even analytics on the website, like everyone keeps going to the website and they spend all the time on this one page and, and um, it seems like it's confusing, right? And if you could find uh, by going through all of those pieces of information, where the friction is, what, what what types of topics tend to trip people up? Is it misperceptions around affordability? Is it um, campus safety? Is it um, like a logistical thing about um, very nuanced question about the Pell Grant? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know because it takes a lot of time to go figure it out and try to mine all of those things. So if that proactive admissions counselor um, could use a tool which Mongoose and I'm sure other companies are working on to help them better find what those topic areas were that were effective or that were friction areas. And then the admissions counselors could say, let's say that we found one really big friction area was out of state students and transfer credits, say. And that was just causing a lot of questions and problems and transfer transfer ad enrollments down 20% or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if that admissions counselor could use technology to deduce, like show me where people fell off um, that were this, were, were this type of student and what were the topic areas. And it turned out to be um, how to get transfer credits for out-of-state students. Um, then that super proactive admissions counselor could tell Chet, GTP, okay, write me a blog post about um, out-of-state students that are transfer students and how credits could apply at our school. 
and it would go and it would like write the whole thing for you and it would be about 80 percent great and then you you could manually go in and like reword things or fine-tune things or ask it to you know could you write this with a different tone um this was too whimsical could you change the tone to this or you know then they could publish the blog and then they could use the texting platform or the email platform to send it out to all the transfers like here's a great resource for the biggest area of friction we had last semester here you go and all of that could have taken one person that was curious found the friction point clarified it created a resource told everybody about the resource and this is before lunch like that's amazing <laughs> and and that and so what so like what i just said is this going to be commonplace right um yeah. we made a comment earlier about would using you know prompts for chat gtp be on your resume i don't know that it would i think it's just anyone that's really resourceful that knows how to figure things out would come through on a resume <laughs> whether it's using chat G, G, gpt in a certain situation or talking to your parents about it because you had a question or meditating I don't know, like whatever the path is to get to where you want to go, this is just one more, you know, highly useful um, and, and efficient tool to problem solve and to find new ways to do things. That's a great, that's a great point. And you'd hope, uh, but then, you know, job, job boards are what they are. There'll be a checkbox. Do you know, do you know, just because some <laughs> HR person will want to be able to search <laughs> off that. So the, uh, well, they, they uh, have that now, like, do you use Microsoft Office and like, yeah, who wouldn't say it, you know, yeah. if you if you have a resume that you've typed, you probably know how to use <laughs> word processing software. I don't know. Just a thought. I, some thoughts I had just to complement what you both mentioned around efficiencies of jobs is job descriptions, right? I actually wrote a job description at another at a company I was working at for a marketing manager in 15 seconds when I, I put in the prompt write me in a marketing manager job description for blah, 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 put the, put the qualifications and it spit out with awesome. the bullet points and everything, including use of, of Microsoft office, et cetera, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, but the, so, so yeah. And, and to your point, it was about, it was about 80% there when I, when I made mm -hmm. it and you go in and you tweak. And I think for a lot of people, the, the efficiency of something like ChatGPT comes in the breaking through your writer's block or breaking through in the creative process where it's like, okay, I have to do something. I have to write about whatever. Give me a first draft, right? Just to get me started. And now what would maybe have taken six hours of thinking time to get to takes 45 minutes because you, you've got that first draft and now you've got more time to do other things. So again, not going to reply not going to replace at least in the short term the, the 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 good copywriter or the good copy editor or the good marketing leader and good think piece creator right but it is going to help make those make those jobs more efficient and more effective and in the reality of an emissions counselor your subject lines of your emails your your content of your emails being more empathetic being more <laughs> impactful you know leveraging the tools to to help your writing get better is is really what the what the is so you I think that's the that's the end of the you know the, the the end game there is use these resources to make your job better, not replace your job, right? Is the is the thing to think about. So so with that, you know, we we could talk for days about this. I mean, people are talking for days. We'll probably have a follow up conversation in you know as as time goes on to to discuss these sorts of things. But for for and for anyone who's uh, listening or watching this podcast, um, you know, David, love for you to kind of share how to keep this conversation going, how to connect with, with you and Andrew, uh, and to get in touch with the team at Mongoose. Sure. So Mongoose, um, you can uh, follow our blog, which is at mongooseresearch.com. And our product, Cadence, um, we're always looking for ways to better incorporate automation into the product. So if you're a client that that, that wants to follow um, some technologies that we're incorporating to help you be more effective. Tell your client success lead that, that you would love to be a part of those programs. Um, cause we're just getting started here and it's, it's a really ac exciting opportunity to, to, for everybody to communicate better. And I don't see a lot of negative about any of that. 
Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for joining us and we will see you all next time on FYI. Thanks, Gil. Thanks, Gil. Thank you.